to the one, to the one who has done all of those things, to the one, you know, you just can't help but when you talk to, when you sing about the Lord, you sing about his greatness, boy, you just, whew, there you go. Your hands go up, the surrender is on. <laughs> when you surrender, what do you do? You raise your hand. I give it up. I surrender. Yeah, praise the Lord. Boy, thank you, praise team. It's so awesome. So great. So great. So great. This is how, yeah. Praise the Lord. Yes, yes. Crystal, you've blessed our heart, and Isaac's back up there thumping around, and glory to God. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the... Uh, the talents and abilities of all the people that are so much a part of what we do here. And, um, and, and God blesses us and God speaks yeah, to us yeah, yeah, yeah. and has been through this book of James. How many of you feel like the book of James has said anything to your heart? Let me just see you, huh? Oh, yeah, four or five of you. Wonderful. All right, good. <laughs> praise the Lord. and Praise the Lord. At least it's not a total loss. Yeah, yeah four or five of you. Okay, beautiful. Uh, well, you four or five, we right there together, aren't we? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it has said a whole lot. Um, I'm going to resist uh, re-preaching, re-preaching. Um, <laughs> no, you're not. Listen to that. I hear you. Oh, well, I mean, as much as I can. <laughs> Do your thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, listen, we were, uh, it's so funny because we were talking about this. I hear, you. I hear you, Brian. Praise the Lord. Thank you. The, um, we were talking about this Wednesday night. We were in a prayer meeting. You know, I was asking the prayer group, hey, pray for me because one of the frailties I have and have had for the 43, 43 or 4 years I've been pastor. I started when I was 18. I'm all, I, this, in, in a few weeks, I'll be 62, so you do the math. Um, and all of those years, throughout all of those years, um, one of the frailties that I have is it's just hard for me to let go of something. You know, it's like when the Lord starts speaking to you through a, a, pa- a, pas- a passion of Scripture or a path of Scripture and a verses of Scripture, and, and He starts speaking to you, it's just hard to kind of move off of it and, and move on with stuff. And so I, I asked the group, I said, hey, pray for me, you know, because I want to do this. And, um, and I said, I'm, it's, it's all me, you know, if nobody said anything, but it's all me, and I feel this, you know, and I, I, I don't want to, you know, condemn, be condemning, so to speak, of myself, but I, it is something within me. I'm more concerned about it than obviously anybody else is. But anyway, the point is, anyway, it, yeah, that's not overflowing it be. We pray for that, don't we? That's right, you guys pray for that. So it really, in essence, what I'm saying is it's your fault, okay? <laughs> I mean, I mean, if you, if you keep praying, if you, some of y'all don't quit praying about this, we're never going to move on to anything else. But anyway, I asked them and I prayed for them. And, and so the suggestion was made that, okay, when I get up here, that somebody would help me when I start, when I start getting kind of into the same stuff, and, start, and, they, and I, when I see this right here, boom, boom, then that means, okay, you're doing it, so move on, you know, and, um, and that was good, all right, and hey, and that was good, but then it dawned into my head, and I said it to them, I said, I'll be glad to, you know, let you do this uh, as long as you'll be responsible for what I would have said uh, and, <laughs> When we stand before God, as long as you'll be responsible for cutting me off uh, and tell him, hey, it was my fault, then let's do it. And then we all decided we, did not, we don't want to take that responsibility, so let's just let it go. You know, let's, let, let's just let the Spirit of God do it. And anyway, so here you go. Now, I'm going, I'm going somewhere. Here we go. Uh, first verse. Come on, Lord, help me get on past. Uh, where do wars and fights come from among you? This is James chapter 4. Do they not come from the desi- your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. Look at that description of, of, of a church who wants something. These guys want something, but look at how they're trying to get it. They're fighting. They're warring. They're murdering. They're, I mean, that's a, this is a church too. You, know? you mean they fight at church? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, they lust, they want, they try to do things, they murder, they, yeah, yeah, people's reputations are killed all the time. People's hearts and passions are killed. All right, here I go. Um, um, 
You fight in war. You fight in war, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. So this, undoubtedly, James is speaking to a church, just like our church, just like any church anywhere in the world. You have to keep reminding yourself of this because of these uh, very uh, stringent things he says about this. You have to keep reminding yourself, this is a church he's talking to, okay? This is not a bunch of lost heathens sitting out beside the road somewhere. This is a church. This is a body of believers that have surrendered themselves to the Spirit of God, that have asked Christ to come into their life and change them and make a difference, that have raised their hands and say, I surrender, white flag. Come on, Jesus. I give it up. Come into my life and change me forever. These are people like this, like us, like a congregation. But you have to keep reminding yourself of that because of these, of these drastic um, descriptions of how they are on the inside. And so uh, we have concluded that this was a bunch of uh, have-nots. You know, you have not because you, don't, you ask not. You ask then and don't receive because you're asking with an ulterior motive. You're not asking for revival for God's sake. You're asking it for your sake. You're not asking for the spiritual gifts of God so that God can be glorified. You're asking so you can be the star, so people can look at you and you can be popular and you can be spiritual and you can be the grand poopa of things in life. You have, a, have bad motives is what he's trying to say. And then in verse 4, we see that James did not read the book How to Win Friends and Influence People uh, because look at what he says. Uh, and I, I want to, when I read it, I want to put, you adulterers, I want to personalize it. The old King James language does. It says, you adulterers and adulteresses. In other words, James looks at them and says, you, you adulterers and adulterers. Boy, that's, that's a way to start a conversation, isn't it? I mean, that makes you want to receive what comes next. Adulterer and adul What? You adulterers and adulteresses, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God? Or do you think that the Scripture says in vain, the spirit that dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace, therefore God said, he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now, this is really important, and it's, it's important that you remember that last little phrase, that God resists, God fights against, God wars against, Everybody look at your neighbor and say, that's not a good fight. That's a bad fight. Bad fight. You know, the apostle Paul said, I have fought the good fight, right? Paul said to Timothy, I have fought the good fight. This is not the good fight. The good fight is with the devil because you can whip him. The bad fight is with God because you can't beat God. So don't find yourself fighting against God because you're fighting a losing battle. So God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So in other words, when we humble ourselves, then God empowers us to be greater than we are. Uh, you talk about this is how I fight my battles, you know, this is how I fight my battles. By surrendering, I become strong because of the grace of God that comes into my life. God empowers me. God endues me with spiritual strength because of the humility of my life to him. Because the essence of sin is rebellion against God. I mean, the essence, what makes, what, what is the bottom line of sin? The bottom line of sin is I don't need God. I can be God. I can be better than God. I can be greater than God. I can be equal with God. Isn't that what got Lucifer kicked out of heaven? Isn't, isn't that what the devil, uh, Lucifer, who becomes the devil that we all wrestle with nowadays, isn't that what his exact life was? Doesn't, isn't that what Isaiah says got him kicked out? Isaiah 13 said, he said, I will exalt my throne above God. I will be greater than God. 
uh, I'll do all the things that God does. I mean, and see, the essence of sin is when we think that same thing. I don't need God. I don't need his power. I don't need to surrender. I'm, I'm my own God. I can do what I want to do. I can be greater than God. I can, you know, have an uh, exalted position. When, when, and that's what pride does in us. And even though none of us, I guarantee you, you're sitting here and, and, you're, not, and you're thinking, I would never do that. I would never think that I was greater than God. I would never think that, 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 that I could be equal to God. But according to these verses, pride does this in us. And that, that the pride of our life will keep us from experiencing the grace of God. Why don't I surrender? I'm, I'm proud, you know. And so because of these attitudes, the next five or six verses have eight imperatives about what to do about this. James says, okay, I've analyzed you. I've looked at your life. I've looked at your church. And here's my evaluation of you. You have not. So you're a possessionless people. You're described more by what you don't have than what you do have. So you're a bunch of have-nots. And, and worse than that, you don't even ask for it. You have not because you ask not. So you don't have and you don't even ask for it. But even worse than that, even when you do ask for it, you don't get it. And the reason why is because you got bad motives. Uh, you want to consume it. You want to want to spend it on yourself. You want to you want to be the star. You want to be the exalted one. And when you do that, you put yourself in direct opposition with God and don't think you're getting anything from God. Because you have become an enemy of God. And that's a horrible place to be, guys. Yeah, yeah. Seriously, horrible place to be. All right, so what do we do about it? What, 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 what happens? How do we fix this? How, how can we become what we need to become? That's the question we have. And so here we go, and James just puts it right on the line like he always does. In the next verse, verse 7, look at it. Therefore, submit to God. And I want to I want to put the old King James flow of that in there too. This is, by the way, these scriptures that we're reading from. This is the New King James version, and it just leaves out some these and thous and hithers and stuff like that. But sometimes uh, it leaves out a word that I like for the emphasis of it. And 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 the word here would be therefore submit yourselves to God, and then resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. So the first imperative here is that we would submit ourselves to God. How is this going to change? How is this have not, ask not, and receive not? How is this going to change? All right, here's the first thing. I, I must submit myself to God. Now, a lot of people quote this verse when they're, when they're in battle all the time and when they have friends that are in battle, you go to a hospital room and somebody's sick and they're you know, wrestling with sickness and they're praying to be healed and so forth. And, and you might say to them as a believer, I tell you what, brother, if you will just resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Or somebody just had a tragedy in their life and, and it feels like the devil's just beating the life out of you and you're a Christian believer and you go to them and with all candor and with all... Uh, you know, encouragement that you can muster up, you say to them, look, man, the Bible says resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And then you might even pray, Lord, we resist the devil and we come against the devil. And we fight against the devil and we command that the devil be gone. You know, and you, you do all of this kind of stuff and you've, and you've forgotten that resist the devil and he'll flee from you is the end of a verse. It's not the beginning of a verse. The beginning of the verse says, first, I must submit myself to God. Then I can resist the devil and, 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 and he will flee from me. The first thing is submission. What is submit? The word submit means to align yourself under someone else's authority. Yeah, when I align myself under your authority, Authority, I have submitted to you. It's what a, it's a really a military word, guys. It's what a it's what a private does to a general. When the general gives the order and the private goes out and carries out the order, 
or the sergeant gives the order and the private goes out and fills the order, what that private has done is he has now submitted himself to the authority of someone that's a higher rank than he is. So he has now surrendered underneath someone else's authority. And so James is saying, the first thing we must do is we must submit ourselves to God. We must align ourselves under the authority of God. Why is this necessary? It's necessary for two reasons. Number one, those verses before have already taught me that if it, that, that if I don't submit myself to God, I find myself in a battle with God. Now, I know this is a little, you know, spiritual thought, and, and we don't see all of these things happening. If, if we could see it in the spiritual realm, if we could look at our lives with all the spiritual stuff happening around us, we could see all that spiritual stuff happening around us. What you would see is the constant warfare of the enemy trying to invade and intrude into your life and the Spirit of God blocking the enemy from you. Yeah. And, and so this, you would see a constant warfare and battle. I'm just saying to you, once you surrender your life to Christ, a battle starts in your life. And I know you've felt this before. You've sensed it, right? Yeah. Many, many of you said, man, my life was easier before I became a Christian. My life was simpler before I became a Christian because before I became a Christian, I didn't have all these struggles. I didn't have all these fights. Well, sure, why? Because once you become a Christian, you become an enemy of the enemy of this world. And he fights in wars to destroy your life. Hey, man, that's what happens all the time, and it's happening all around you, and it's only the Spirit of God that keeps him from destroying your life. So what am I telling you? I'm telling you that if you do not submit yourself to God, you are now trying to fight a battle in your life on two separate fronts. You're already fighting the devil, but if you don't submit, you still stay proud and you resist God. Now you're not only fighting the devil, you're actually fighting against God. So now, now you have a battle on two fronts in your life, and I'm just saying to you, you don't have enough power to fight on two fronts. Paul said, I fought the good fight, meaning the devil. Don't fight the bad fight, which means God. God's going to whip you. You'll never, you'll never be successful. You'll never accomplish anything. So I must submit first because I can't fight a battle on two fronts. Here's the second reason. The second reason is once I submit myself to God, then all of the resources of God belong to me. And I'll tell you what I mean. I'm a citizen of this country. I'm a U.S. citizen. That means I have the privilege on April the 15th. April the 17th this year, because the 15th, I think, is on a Saturday. So you get extended to the 17th to get your taxes in. You get the privilege, you get the privilege of paying the taxes on your income in order to submit as a citizen of this country. But once I do that, then all of the resources of the United States of America are there now to protect me. See, I live back here in this community right behind the church. We have streets and houses and all that. I don't have any fear that the, that the Russians or the Koreans or uh, whoever else might manifest, the Iranians or whoever they are. I have, I have no fear that I'm going to wake up and there's going to be an army of, of, of intruders on my street marching down my street, knocking my door down, dragging me out of the bed and killing my neighbors. I don't have any fear of that. Why? Because our country has armies and weapons and, 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 and because we are surrendered to it and we submit by, by cooperating with what we're asked to do as a citizen then all the resources of this country are there to protect me. Yeah. Now, I'm just saying to you, once you submit yourself to God, all of the resources of God are available to you to fight battles for you. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're just saying, and I, I love it. Boy, I love that. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. It may look like I'm surrounded. Yeah, I am surrounded. I'm surrounded by you, you know. And, and, and the reason why is because I have submitted myself to you. 
And therefore, I, my, the way I fight my battles is to surrender to you, to, to humble myself to you, to give myself to you. And when I praise him and when I exalt him and when I surrender to him, I'm, God's fighting my battles for me. And so, first of all, the first thing, if I'm a not, 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 and have not, and ask not, and I don't want to be that anymore, and I don't want to be an enemy of God, and I want God to work powerfully in my life, the first thing James says is you must submit yourself to God. Then, secondly, what did, in the last, then resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. So first, I submit myself to God, then resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Now, uh, how do you resist the devil? How, you resist the devil by, uh, by, by, uh, uh, Stop, you are. I'm wondering, what are you doing? I'm you oh, thank you. I need it. I need it. Can you swing the camera? <laughs> I'm stifled. Mm. It's like a crowd, you know. Yeah. Anyway, let me move over here to my new territory a little bit. <laughs> Open those gates. All right, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. All right, resist, all right, uh, submit to God, then I can resist the devil. And the question becomes, how do, I, how do I resist the devil? What does it mean to resist the devil? Because I can't see the devil, right? I mean, if the devil was, a, was an enemy that I could see, then I could fight against the devil, but I can't see him. It, so that means that I'm trying to fight against someone that I can't see. So I can't shoot him. I can't stab him. I can't knock him over the head with a club <laughs> to resist him. So how can I resist the devil? Well, Jesus told us how to resist the devil. And he not only told us how to resist the devil, but he even showed us how to resist the devil. I know most people find this hard to believe, but when Jesus was on this earth, Jesus did not, um, did not uh, exalt himself over us and do things that we do not have the ability to do. Uh, you know, Jesus said, uh, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. Jesus did things that we can do through the Spirit of God. He, I mean, he was baptized in the Spirit of God, you know, empowered Jesus, and the, the dove lit on his shoulder, and the Father spoke out of heaven and said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And, and so as Jesus walked on this earth, Jesus could have done lots of things, but he didn't. He, he did things that the Spirit of God that empowered him is the same Spirit of God that empowers us, and he said, all right, when this happens, let me show you how to do this. So in Matthew chapter 4, as an example, Jesus was led out into the wilderness, according to, the, uh, according to his own words, for the purpose of being tempted by the devil. Yeah, yeah. And the devil came to him and brought a rock up there and said, you know, you must be hungry because, you know, you've been out here for like 40 days you, 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 and you hadn't eaten anything. And you're the son of God. You can do anything. And so command that this stone be made bread so that you can eat this, you know, this stone-made bread and, and quench your hunger. And what did Jesus do? Now, Jesus could have banished the devil. Jesus could have whipped the devil. Jesus could have annihilated the devil right there on the spot because Jesus is God, you know? I mean, Jesus could have pulled rank and said, boom, out of here, you little ragweed. I mean, he could have grabbed him by the neck and body slammed him up and down on the ground. I mean, he could have done anything to the devil because Jesus is Jesus. Yeah, yeah. But he didn't do it because we can't do that. That would not be an example of something we had the power to do. So Jesus said, let me show you how you can do this. So he looks at, at the devil who's standing there with this rock in his hand and commanding that be made bread. And Jesus says, oh, let me tell you what the Bible says. This is a quote out of the book of Deuteronomy. Many of you may not even know where that book is. 
That book is that book is like the fourth book of the Bible. You know, I mean, it's right there in the first. It's, it, it means the second numbering. It means uh, the first generation that got the commandments of God blew it, and when the second generation came in, they didn't have the, that commandment, so God gave it to them again. Therefore, the book of second numbering, Deuteronomy, is what that is. And and so, but but the point being that. Uh, Jesus took a quote out of an obscure Old Testament book and said, Man shall not live by bread alone. Boom, Deuteronomy 9. And, 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 and he just slapped the devil. He just, shh, you know, he took the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, according to Ephesians. It's like, uh, here's Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy becomes a sword in the hand of Jesus. And he says, Man does not live by bread alone. And it's like, shh, you stabbing the devil with it. And the devil does a little Texas two-step because he's light on his feet. And he, and he, and he, and he, you know, he steps back and goes, woo! And, but he's not finished yet because he's a very determined enemy. And then, and then the devil took Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem just by, you know, by immediacy of, 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 of being able to supernaturally uh, put yourself in a, in a place. These are spiritual beings. And, and so Jesus and the devil are now on the pinnacle of, of the temple in, in Jerusalem, and they're looking down, and it's a long way down there. And the devil says to him, uh, but, you know, I tell you what you need to do. You need to just, 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 just jump off of this temple right here. Look at all those people down there. They're looking up and they're going, what are they doing up there? And they're chanting and they're, you know, jump, jump, you know how crazy people are. And they, and they, and, and he, and devil said, look, if you will do this, if you will do it, we know, uh, you know, Jesus, we know that God has so protected you that there are angels surrounding you and those angels are not going to let you get hurt by throwing yourself off of this temple. These angels, we know these angels have been given a command by your father saying don't even let him stump his toe as he walks through, walks around. So these angels are protecting you and if you jump off of here, they're going to catch you before you hit the ground and then all of those people down there are going to be so impressed. They're going to go, wow, did you see that? And he said, I, the, hey, Jesus, the quickest way you can impress all these people that you are different and you are from God, and, the, and they'll believe you when they see this because they're just waiting for some miraculous sign, and they're going to go, wow, did you see that? That's the Son of God, the devil said. That's what's going to happen. And so I just suggest that you do that. And then Jesus, again, taking another verse out of obscure Deuteronomy, says, uh, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Shh. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God again, stabs the enemy. Shoo! And, 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 the, and he does a little two-step again, and he, he's not finished yet. And he says, look at, all, look at this out here. Look at all these kingdoms of the world out there. You see them all? Yeah, you can have them if you'll just fall down and worship me. Yeah. I mean, and Jesus didn't argue with him and say, they don't belong to you. I mean, he didn't even say any. He, he could have said that, but, but he didn't even argue with him. He didn't even say, hey, you don't have any right to give them away because they don't belong to you. But, but Jesus just looked at him, and here's Jesus. Jesus takes another quote out of an obscure book of Deuteronomy, another quote out of Deuteronomy again, and says, and says thou, shalt serve, thou shalt love the Lord thy God, and him only shall you serve. Shoot. And, uh, and the Bible says the third time the angel, the devil left him and the angels came and ministered to Jesus. So how do you resist the devil? Same way Jesus did. Same exact way Jesus did. It's the word of God. Let me, let me, let me give you a verse, some verses. In Ephesians chapter 6, you can write that in the margin by your notes. I don't have it on the screen up here, but in in Ephesians chapter 6, the Bible says that we are to put on the whole armor of God yeah, yeah. and having done all to stand because there's going to come an evil day in your life. 
Do, do some of you feel like you have evil days in your life? Do you feel like sometimes uh, all of the bad things that could happen seem to be saved up for one day? And all of a sudden, that, those things just begin to happen one right on top of each other, on top of each other. I mean, you don't even get over one before the other attaches to you. And, 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 it, and, and then at the end of the day, you say, Whoo, thank God this day's over with. Because you felt, like, you felt like you've been attacked by everything. Well, that's what Ephesians 6 says, that there are evil days like this. There are days where the enemy just seems to, to attack in wave after wave after wave. And so, and so the, the Scripture is saying to protect yourself against that, you put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. It says, have your feet shod. Put on some shoes that are preparation of the gospel of peace. In other words, cover up your feet from the sharp rocks and the embedded uh, dangers of walking on, on hurtful things and have, your, have, have, have gospel shoes on that make you prepared to speak a word to anybody. Have on the belt of truth wrapped around you to protect this midsection, this vulnerable section, and then have on the breastplate of righteousness, of being right with God, and, and then have on the helmet of salvation to protect all of your thoughts and your thinking. And, and then he said, and, and, and take the shield of faith that, that you might quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and then, and then arm yourself with the sword of the Spirit. And then he says, I don't want you to miss what it is. And so the verse says, which is the word of God. So, so we have five defensive weapons. We have a helmet. We have a breastplate. We have a belt. We have a shoes. And we have a shield. Five defensive weapons. And one offensive weapon, the sword of the Spirit. Now, I'm just saying to you, this is our armor. This is, what, this is how we resist the devil. We use the defensive weapons that we have. But nobody ever wins a game playing defense only. I know that the, 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 th the, the common quote about sports is it takes a great defense to win a championship. And we've seen that happen a lot of times. But I'm submitting to you that nobody ever won a championship without any offense at all. Nobody ever won by simply playing defense all the time. So God has given defensive weapons, but we're to take the offense too. We're to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and we fight with that Word. This is how I fight my battles, the Word of God. <laughs> this is how I fight my battles, submission to God. This is how I fight my battles, praise to Him, surrender to Him, exalting Him. That's how we submit ourselves to the Lord, and then we can resist, and all the weaponry of God becomes our weaponry to protect us from these things that harm us. And if I'm just submitting to you that if Jesus can take three obscure verses out of the book of Deuteronomy, you and I ought to be able to take the entire word of God and, and use that to fight the enemy of our soul. And that's how we play offense and that's how we, we, we fight these battles. So I first submit, then secondly, I resist the devil. And then verse 8 says, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. The third admonition is that we would draw close to God. How do you draw close to God? I've heard people say this. I can't get any closer to God than I am. And here's why they say that. And here's their, their, their thinking. I can't get any closer to God than I am because when I get saved, the Holy Spirit of God comes and lives on the inside of me. And so because God is living on the inside of me, I can't get any closer to God than I already am. Now, if that is true, follow my reasoning. If that is true, then I have no idea what James chapter 4 verse 8 is talking about. Because that verse clearly says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Now, my submission to you is that we can draw 
closer to God, that we can get nearer to God. And the reason why is because none of us are ever quite as close as we think we are to God. And the fact is that God sometimes has to show us <laughs> that we're not as quite as close as we think we are. Has God ever shown you that you're not quite as far along as you thought you were? Yeah, you, you, you said in your, your heart, whew, thank God I don't have to fight that battle anymore. Because you say, that's long in my past, and I've conquered that, and I don't talk like that anymore, or I don't act like that anymore, and I don't say things. I don't, I don't exhibit th that, that same vanity that I had, and I'm not, as, I'm not as tender and prideful as I used to be, and I can take things. I'm a bigger person now, and I'm, I've got that, thank God I've got that under control in my life, and, the, and before you know it, something happens, and boom, you blare out, or you show out, or you, you know, you think think it out, you say it out, you, and then when it's over, you're ashamed of yourself. And you say, ooh, I thought I was further along than that. Well, that's God allowing you to see uh, you're not quite as big as you think you are. Right, you're not right. You're not, as, you're not as full of me as you thought. Now, let me ask you this. When God does that, is God, is God being... Uh, is God being unfair to you? Is this, is this something that would, is, this, is God trying to hurt you? Is God, is God trying to uh, show you something? Well, no, God's not trying to hurt you. God's not trying to, to make you ashamed. Uh, God's trying to help you see where you are. And do you need to know where you are? Certainly you need to know where you are. You need to know that there are things that, you, that, that can draw, draw you closer, things that can be a better surrender. I mean, it's just like when a doctor looks at you, you go in and you have symptoms and a doctor looks at you and they do all of these tests and they look at you and he says, listen, I'm so sorry to tell you this, but we're going to have to do some surgery because one of the valves of your heart's not working right. Is that doctor being unkind to you? Is he being mean to you? No, he's... He's telling you something that will save your life. So he's not trying to make you nervous and make you anxious and, and hurt your feelings. He's trying to help you live. Or if he looks and says, that spot there is cancer, and if we don't get it, it's going to kill you. Is he being unkind when he says that? No. He, he, he's, he's saying, we're going to have to deal with this, or, or it's going to be bad. So what I'm saying to you is that James says, we need to draw near to God. And, I, and, and then look at what it says. It says, if we will draw near to God, he will draw near to us. In other words, if we draw near to God, we're not going to find the door locked on God's side. When, if we will draw close to him, then he's going to be able to draw close to us. If we will open the door on our side, God will open the door on his side. Our response draws a divine response from God. But look who takes the initiative. The initiative is, he says, you draw close to him, and then he will draw close to you. So who's responsible to take the, the initiative of this? We are. It's our job to draw close to God. <laughs> there are two things that you'll never find God doing. Number one, you won't find God doing anything that he's done before. In other words, if, if you, you know, he's already done it, and then you say, well, God, and he said, look, no, 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 I'm not going back to the cross. I've already been to the cross. I've already died on the cross, and the, your sins have been paid for on the cross. So I'm not going back. So you'll never find God doing something he's already done. And number two, you'll never find him doing something that he gives you the authority to do. You draw closer to him, and then he'll draw closer to you. He's not going to do it for you because... That's your job. He's given you the authority to do that. So uh, that's the, the, what, the third? All right. Uh, let me read it off of here. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Notice, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Just in general, now these are two different things on your outline, so you'll, you'll need you know, to know this. But this verse is saying that there are two general things that are that are hindering us in our uh, in our nearness to God 
Uh, one of them has to do with the methods we use in life, and the other one has to do with the motives, why we do what we do. I mean, I, I can have a bad motive and clean method, and I can mess up my clean method by my bad motive. I can have a bad method, a nasty, dirty method, but I can have a clean heart, why I want to do it, but my bad motive is going to mess up my good, I mean, my, my bad method is going to mess up my good motive. And so let me just show what I mean. All right, no, number, what is this, uh, five, uh, four, five, four. All right, number one, examine your, uh, examine your methods. All right, he said, he says, all right, clean, cleanse your hands, you sinners. I, let me, let me approach this way. I take one bath a day, generally. Sometimes Tanya has to get on me to get her. Do, do, do any of you other guys have a trouble at wanting to take a bath? <laughs> a shower, or, you know, I mean, do you have it? It's like some days I say, I didn't get dirty today. I'm not sure, I'm not sure any, I'm not sure any of you ladies. I'm, a, I'm meddling now, right? I'm meddling. Well, generally, I take, I take one shower a day whether I need it or not. But I'm constantly washing my hands all throughout the day. Why is that? It's because my hands come in contact with the world around me. It is my hands. I mean, my chest may never touch the world around me. My stomach may never touch. It's, it's getting easier because it's getting bigger. <laughs> My stomach may never touch the world around me. You know, I know it. My thighs might never touch the world around me, but I'm constantly coming in contact with the world with my hands. So this verse says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. And what your hands is talking about the way you do things, your methods. Now, let me, let me just kind of translate this out for us to think. All right. What he's saying is that we must be careful how we do the things we do. The methods that we use to propagate the gospel, the methods that we use to uh, uh, promote what we do or, or present him to the king, to the world, or, uh, or promote the, the Christ-like. Or, in other words, be careful how you do what you do because how you do what you do, the methods that you use can, can be corrupt. And if they are, they're going to corrupt the whole deal. I mean, I've seen churches, because I'm a pastor, let me just put it in the church world, and this is, maybe this will get you the point. Uh, I've seen churches do everything and, and to, to, quote, minister the gospel. I've seen the pastor stand up and say, uh, if we have 500 in, in Bible study Sunday morning, I'll eat a goldfish, I'll swallow goldfish on the stage. If we have, uh, 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 if we have 100 baptized, I'll shave my head. As if that's a punishment. <laughs> but in, in, other wor in other words, the pastor is going to become a clown um, if we reach a certain goal. Now, the motive is to reach people for Christ. The motive is a good motive. But the way you're going about it is presenting the man of God as a foolish person not to be taken seriously like the class clown or something. The pastor sits in a dunking booth making fun of his members while they throw balls trying to dunk him in the booth. It's a bad, bad method, bad method. Who would want a pastor like that? Who would want to mock and make foolish the man of God? The one that's going to stand beside the graveside with you. The one that's going to come in and pray with you in the hospital. I mean, this is a bad method. And so James is just saying, if I want to be powerful with God and I want to be cleansed with God and I want to have because I ask and I'm going to receive when I ask because it's, it's not, I'm not using shabby, worldly, ridiculous, carnal methods, I have to be careful. I have to cleanse my hands constantly to make sure my methods are good methods. And then he says... Purify your hearts, you double-minded, which simply means examine your motives. 
So I not only have good methods, I must have good motives. Why? What is a motive? A motive is why do you do the things you do? Not, not only how do you do the things you do, but why do you do the things you do? Can I have, can, 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 can bad motives mess up a good method? Sure it can. Can a bad method mess up a pure motive? Sure it can. So what James is saying is examine yourselves constantly, cleanse your hand, purify your hearts, pay attention to how you do what you do, and then pay attention to why you're doing what you do. All right, now number six. All right, Are y'all okay? Can we go? I want to get this. All right, number eight. Thir number eight, draw near to God and he'll draw to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Next verse, lament and warn uh, lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaven. Heaviness. What in the world is this? Well, these are strange words for us. Take a real look at Christ in your life is the instruction there. Let me go on. These are weird words. These are strange words for us, aren't they? Look, lament, mourn, weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Um. I knew James was a killjoy, <laughs> didn't you? I, 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 I knew he was one of these starch, shirt, Puritan kind of guys. I mean, here we are jumping up and down and shouting and having a good time with God, and here comes James saying to us, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Um, and, and quite frankly, I'm, I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in, in, in weeping and being afflicted and mourning. And I, I mean, I like to feel good. Do you? Yeah. I mean, let's face it. It feels good to feel good, right? And, 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 and so I want to feel good. I want to soar in the spirit. I want to rise up on eagle's wings. I want to have uh, goosebumps play leapfrog up and down my spine. And James, and James is coming in here in verse 9 and saying, No, lament and mourn and weep and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. What in the world is he talking about? Well, he's talking about the same thing that John was talking about in the first chapter of the book of Revelation. When, the, when, the, when John on the Isle of Patmos, the one who laid his head on Jesus' breast and, and, and the one who in his gospel said, doesn't even use his own name, he just says, the one who Jesus loved. The one who, the one who at the cross, the only disciple at the cross, and, Je and Jesus looked at him and, and said, this is your mother, pointing his own mother out, and mom, this is your boy from now on. I mean, that John that was that close to Jesus and that personally f a friend of Jesus, John, that same John says in the first chapter of the book of Revelation, when I saw Jesus returning on that, on that white horse, he said, I fell at his feet as a dead man. It's the same thing that Isaiah felt when, 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 when the Lord looked at him and said, uh, who will go for me? And who shall I send? And Isaiah said, don't send me, God. And he fell on his face and said, I'm a man of unclean lips. It's the same thing that when Daniel came into the presence of God, he fell at his feet like a dead man. It, as a matter of fact, everybody in the Old Testament and the New Testament, anytime they came face to face with the glory of God, what is the first thing that happened to them? They passed out. They fell out. They had, to be, they had to be lifted up. The angel or the spirit had to say, fear not, and pick them up off the ground. What does that mean? It, what does James mean? It means, look, when, when I come into the presence of an awesome God, that presence overwhelms me. And the way you can tell that something is happening deeply spiritual in my life is that I become, I get overwhelmed with what God is doing in my life, and the first thing that happens to me is, is I, am, I am abased. I, I, am, I see myself the way I really am. I, I, I look at myself the way I really am. In the presence of the, of the white, hot glory of God, I'm exposed to the real me. And when I see the real me, I'm not happy about the real me. 
I, I, I want to repent before God. I, wanna, I, I don't want to be exalted. The first thing that happens when the Spirit of God exposes me to me is I'm not exalted. I'm abased. I'm put down. I fall down because I don't like what I see. So James says, how, how can you tell real revivals come in your heart? When you jump up and shout and clap your hands and raise your hands and bounce around the congregation with joy in your life? No, he said, the first thing we can say that when God comes and God shows you the real you is that you're going to be a base. You're going to fall out. You're going you're gonna to weep and you're going to mourn and you're going to say, God, how could I be this way after all these years? Forgive me. Move in my life, God. I, 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 change me, God. Move me, God. That's, that's how you can tell that the Spirit of God is working. You'd be surprised how many people evaluate a service by how good they feel when they walk out. Did it make me happy to be at church today? Am I more satisfied than I was? And that's how you evaluate, okay, it was a good service today because I feel real good. James says the way you can tell that the Spirit of God has moved is if you feel real bad because you have seen yourself for what you are. And you are not pleased with what you are from the inside. And then, let, let me give you this last one. I know I'm going way over. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he'll lift you up. Which becomes humble yourself. <laughs> okay? Humble yourself. Now, notice who he says is responsible for the humbling. Who is it? Moi. Uh, I am to humble myself. I have heard people constantly or continually, I've heard people say, humble me, God, humble me, humble me, God, humble me. Humble. I want to be a humble person, God, God, humble me. God. And, and God says, no, I'm not humbling you. You humble yourself. I mean, it's not my responsibility to humble you. I, you, you humble yourself. And then they oh, God, humble me. I can't humble myself. Oh, God, humble me. And so you just keep demanding that God humbles you. But I, what, 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 you remember what I said to you a while ago about the two things God won't do? God will never do something that he's done, already done before. And number two, he'll never do anything that he gives you the authority to do. So God is not going to humble you. Let me tell you what God's going to do to you. He's going to humiliate you. If you keep demanding that God does it, he says, all right, all right. All right, I've already told you to do it. You're not going to do it. You're going to keep begging me. So I'm fixing, to, I'm fixing to do something. You know what I'm fixing to do? I'm fixing to humiliate you. And then you'll humble yourself. I, I, I don't know if you have thoughts like this, dreams like this, but, but have you ever dreamed that, that you were doing something and there were a crowd of people around and they seemed to be enjoying whatever it was that were, you were saying or doing and then all of a sudden at some point you realize you don't have any pants on? <laughs> Is, has, anybody, has this ever happened to anybody but me? Well, the, psych, the psychiatrists tell us that that's because uh, you have a feeling of of being vulnerable, uh, you know, you're, you're, you, have a, you have a sense that you fear being exposed, you know, and that's kind of one of those psychological deals when you have a dream like that. Uh, but I'm not a psychologist or the son of one, so it, it doesn't matter. But, but, uh, <laughs> but let me show, in connection with humbling yourself, uh, uh, I, I'm up here and, and, the, and the crowd is with me and the crowd is laughing and I'm telling them a little funny in there and, and they look like they're enjoying it and man, their eyes are just focused on me and I'm thinking to myself, man, all right, good, boy, I'm, I'm doing it good and they're getting a good, and, and then all of a sudden I discover I don't, I don't have these broxers with hearts on them or something. And, and I understand the reason they were with me, the reason they were smiling, the reason they were following me, the reason they were is because I'm up here making a fool out of myself in my drawers. Uh, and and it, it wasn't what I was saying that was impressing them. It was the fact of how, of, of the fact that somebody's up in front of them with only their, you know, skibbies on. And, uh, <laughs> and all of a sudden now I'm humiliated. And then I humble myself. When I'm humiliated, I humble myself. So don't make God do this. You humble yourself. And then the last one, so you can fill in your notes. And I'm going to just do this. Avoid criticizing other believers. And I'm going to get that next week because it feeds right into what comes next in the book. But I'm just going to tell you that what this has to do with, it has to do with that, with that mean, critical spirit 
that is, that is forever finding fault with other believers and criticizing other believers. And this is a no-no according to James. So there you go. Why don't you stand to your feet with me real quick, all right? Praise the Lord. Thank you for being so patient.